I'm now joined by a very special guest. She's a former staff writer for Bleacher Report. She is currently writing for The Ringer and is the first girl to join her elementary school's all-boys basketball team. But beyond all of that, she is the author of her debut book titled Giannis, The Improbable Rise of an NBA MVP. It is Miss Mirren Fader. Mirren, thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, no, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I want to start off with this. We are talking less than 24 hours after the subject of your book, Giannis Antetokounmpo, captured his first ever NBA title. For you to have spent a year profiling his journey, what do you think is going through his head right now? Just absolute elation. You know, I mean, he he always, I think, believed that this could happen, but it never, you know, there were so many obstacles and, you know, he stayed because he wanted to win. He stayed because he had faith in this franchise and this team. And so it's just, it's really cool to see the patience pay off. You know, I'm not sure a lot of people would have had that type of patience and, and belief and, and work ethic. Yeah, and rebounding off that, that leads me to my next question. You were writing this book at a time where there was a bunch of speculation surrounding whether or not Giannis would stay in Milwaukee. So how stressful was it for you to you know, figure out how to finish a book about somebody who you didn't even know where the next chapter of his career would take him? No, I know. It was so stressful. I was like, okay, I have no idea how to end this book right now. Um, <laughs> because when I, <laughs> which is not a good sign, um, you know, when I signed up for the book, it was March 2020, you know? And so I was like, okay, I'm not going to worry about the end part. I have no idea. I can't control that. But, you know, in December, when he announced that he was staying, I was like, okay, thank God, because, <laughs> yeah. such a, you know, I, it's like, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to get as close as possible to that, you know, him announcing that he's staying at the end so and flashing back to march of 2020 before signing your book deal you did go to milwaukee to talk to youngest brother alex and peeper at pfizer forum but then the world shut down i know you were scheduled to go to greece but then that turned into 221 interviews from your apartment so walk me through that adjustment of waking up at 6 a.m to contact sources in greece and then finding even more people who knew Giannis and his family so we have a copy machine in there and uh, there's just a lot of, a lot of caffeine consumed. Um, but no, yes, I, I was like, damn, this is, you know, going to be the hardest thing I think I've ever had to do, but was also, um, I guess, encouraged by the fact that I knew how lucky I was, you know, like the, the world is just being destroyed by this awful pandemic. And I, I was fortunate to have a job. And so I just was like, all right, you're so lucky put your heart into this. And um, I actually loved interviewing the people from Greece. It was, you know, I became a morning person. I, I was not, but like I mentioned, the caffeine, I became yeah. one. And um, it was just so cool to hear the pride in their voices. You know, when you ask these people about Giannis, they just, they beam and they ask, do you need anything else? You know, not because of me, but because of him. Um, you know, when you interview 221 people that all say, really positive things about someone that, you know, it's safe to say that, you know, he is beloved. And looking at his time in Greece, he would be, you know, called a monkey on the court. He was undocumented because Greece doesn't allow citizenship. And even his family, they had to worry about a neo-Nazi group in the Golden Dawn, which is a criminal organization. In your book, how do you approach these racial and social issues that Giannis and his family had to combat? Yeah, it's a big part of the book. You know, we have the early section about the racism, like shouting insults at him during the game or, you know, the fear of deportation or, you know, Giannis's childhood friends would tell me how scared he'd be when police or these Golden Dawn terrorists would just be in the street. And so um, it was so important to include that because nobody really knows anything about that. You know, his story has been framed as, as such a feel good narrative because it is feel good. It is inspiring, but they leave out that part that is so central. Um, and I, I'm happy that it didn't end there in the book at the end of, you know, towards the end of the book, I, I chart the journeys of other black migrant basketball players in Greece that were not able to ascend the way that Giannis was because they didn't get their citizenship fast track to show that like Giannis was incredibly lucky. You know, if this didn't happen for him, he would likely have a similar path to these people. And um, even today, like, you know, Giannis is beloved in Greece, but there's also so many people that are still racist there. Um, I think it was like two years ago, the opening scene to, I think it's chapter 11 is one of his, um, 
murals of him being desecrated with swastikas um, and other and other Nazi symbols. So yeah, so I I chart how the racism continues on and and also how hesitant Giannis has been to talk about it um, throughout his career and how you know as he gets older and more up to the present day he's been more vocal about it for sure. And when you look at his hardships, he ended up being given a lot of things by the Greek government, but that was after his potential to reach the NBA was seen. How much did your conversations with the Greece prime minister reveal the level of blame that the Greek government may have had on the hardships that Giannis faced? Yeah, it was super revealing. Um, Anthony Samaras was a prime minister that you mentioned that I spoke to and just he just kind of kept dodging it. And of course, admitted like basically the, you know, he got the citizenship because he was a basketball player that was destined for the NBA. And, um, you know, Samaras kept using the word alien. And um, I found that to be telling as well, because Giannis is not an alien. Um, and I'm using air quotes for our listeners that can't see um, because he was born there. He is Greek through and through, um, but he was not treated that way. And then all of these challenges, we'd even touch on his on-court action. He'd even play mm-hmm. for the division in Greece. He played for the A2 division and never A1. So when you look at the American and international scouts, I know you touched on this in a book, how much did that help him and seeing them discover his talent, but how much doubt was there because of the fact that he never played that higher level of basketball? Yeah, it was definitely there. Like I would describe Giannis at that point in time as just a big question mark. You know, you knew he was talented. Like scouts weren't flying to Greece to discover talent. The talent was discovered. Now the question was how good, how good can he be, right? Like there's been a lot of revisionist history. Like I knew he was good or I saw this and it's like, no, you didn't. Like a lot of people, (laughs) a lot of people were like very interested in him because they could see the potential, but you just couldn't project with him because you didn't have other, um, you know, players that came from this division. You didn't have um, reliable stats. You didn't have game film that was uh, good enough. I mean, it was horrible. It was grainy. You couldn't tell how tall he was. So, you know, it was definitely so crazy that he got drafted because it was a huge risk. And when you look at the fact that he got drafted, I know his family kind of struggled with trusting people because of the fact that in Greece, they lived in a predominantly white neighborhood. So in your book, how do you touch on how Giannis developed his relationships? And do you think the fact that he lived in a place that was racist towards him and his family, did that impact the level of trust that he had in others when he got drafted? Yeah, it's definitely an interesting dynamic. He both had a lot of friends and a lot of white Greeks that were amazing to him and respected him and treated him with dignity and support and teammates that looked out for him and gave him food and, you know, the kindness of random strangers. I mentioned a godmother named Marietta in the book, a white woman who would always fix him a hot plate or um, Yanitsika is a cafe owner at Kiboto's Cafe who would help him out. But then there were people that were just so awful to him and did not respect him and treated him, um, you know, as an object and not as a human being. And, you know, the threat of deportation always loomed because he always feared that one day if his parents weren't there, he wouldn't know. And and what do you do next? And so there was a, a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear that he lived with. And um, it definitely translated when he came to America. There's one anecdote. Um, it's my favorite anecdote in the book about coming to America and um, a cable guy coming over to um, install something. And, and Giannis was so distrustful of people because of the things we just talked about. He asked for a buck staffer to be there. And, uh, The Buck Staffer's there all day. It takes forever. And he's hungry. He goes into Giannis's pantry. He eats a couple of Oreos, doesn't think anything of it. Comes to practice the next day. Giannis is like, did you take my Oreos? And the staffer's like, what? You know? And then then Giannis is like, well, I noticed three were missing. Um, And so it's just such a, it's just such a example of what we're talking about, which is he can't escape what he went through. And even though he's in America, he has food now, he has money now, he's always the child that is fearful of not having enough. And that trust, it didn't only stay with Giannis, but it stayed with his entire family. I know that you interviewed pretty much every single person close to Giannis for this book. How did you develop those relationships? Because I know at first when you were talking to his mother, she was kind of distance on the couch away from you. But as time mm-hmm. went on, how did that relationship grow to the point where she opened up to you about a long range of things? Yeah, I think that day that you're referencing that I spent in Milwaukee um, was just such a special day. I got to go to their home. Um, I got to be around them at the practice facility. Um, 
I think it's just asking questions about more than just painful experiences. I think they're so used to people being so enamored by their hardships. People rarely ask about the joy and the happiness and the good times. And um, so, you know, I think maybe that opened up um, people a bit more to see that I genuinely wanted to do this story accurately. And that means that, you know, you're not just talking about hard times, you're talking about good times too. And he didn't only lean on his family while he was drafted or after he was drafted, he leaned on teammates. More specifically, the first notable one being Karan Butler to the point where he made Giannis do the amount of push-ups to signify <laughs> that he turned, right? Can you talk to me about how Karan Butler served as kind of the first non-family member to really get close to Giannis and then all the other teammates after that and coaches that impacted Giannis's career up to this point? Yeah, that's one of my favorite anecdotes in the book. Like, can you imagine Giannis doing push-ups in the club <laughs> as a Karan? <laughs> Respect. Um, yeah, I love that anecdote. Karan is great. He's a great human. Um, you know, he he was just so impressed that Giannis would get excited to do rookie duties, like go get me some of this, go do that. Giannis thought it was like an exciting thing to be entrusted with getting donuts. You know, it was just wow. so pure and so refreshing. And so Karan couldn't out that, but Karan served a deeper purpose. He would talk to him about other things like um, what it is to be black in America and what a hoodie, you know, signifies. And, you know, especially being in Milwaukee, uh, which is an incredibly segregated place, uh, a place that has a long history of racism, mass incarceration, redlining, like all those things. And he really educated Giannis. So he was just very central to him, not just on the court, but off the court. And along with Karan Butler, you also touched on his relationship with Jason Kidd. Can you speak a little bit mm -hmm. about how that relationship came through fruition, not only for Giannis, but the way you told it throughout your book? You know, Jason Kidd, um, he's a complicated figure. Um, his methods not uh, popular, to say the least, with many people because of the way that he approaches things. But Jason also made Giannis into a really, really great player at the time. He entrusted him with the ball. He believed in him. He was the first coach that kind of said, you could be a superstar. And he said, you're better going downhill. Um, looking back now, pretty wise. But he also had methods that Giannis, you know, was not a fan of, like speaking up and calling him out in the film room. And um, just some of Jason kids tactics, which you'll see in the book are, are just very uh, different. And um, so, yeah, I think Giannis, um, I think he would definitely credit Kid with helping morph him into who he was. It was an important mode of his development. And although Kid obviously ended up not being with the team, can you attribute Giannis' success at this point in time to the fact that Kid put so much responsibility on him, put so much on his back and called him out at times where other players would be uncomfortable being told those type of things? I mean, I think Kid, you know, has a, a place in his journey. You know, Giannis would be the first to say it takes a village to make someone great. And Kid definitely, you know, helped him with this. But it was also Sean Sweeney, you know, the assistant coach on Kid's staff. Sweeney spent hours and hours and hours and hours with Giannis, you know, devouring film. And so I think all of these people played a tiny role. I think Giannis would be successful no matter who coached him. Um, it was his own work ethic that got him to where he is. But for sure, all these people impacted him. I kind of want to shift gears now to the family aspect. If there's a central theme of the book, it's family. From his mom selling stuff on the side of the road, selling her wedding ring so the family would have enough money to eat. Talk to me about how much family plays a central role in this story. You probably don't even have a story without family in it, I, I'm sure. Yeah, you definitely don't have a book without family. You don't have the full picture without family. Um, that's why I wanted to write the book. I mean, when I profiled Alex, um, the youngest brother, as well as Giannis for Bleacher Report, which is what the book came out of, that's just the thing that made me want to write the book because I was just like, wow, there's close and then there's this family's closeness. It's completely different. Um, you know, Giannis, Jared Dudley um, of the Lakers had to convince Giannis at 21 years old that he should get his own spot. But he was just like, no, I can't leave my mom. I can't leave my family. So so, um, you know, I, I just think it's so special and it's so pure. And um, that's why a lot of people love him, because he never forgets those who have been with him this whole time. And can you speak on the type of things that you present when it comes to his father in the book? Because obviously, as soon as he won the NBA title yesterday night, the first thing he did, he went into the crowd, he hugged his family. But obviously, his father is not with him. So tell me about that and how he's played such a huge role in Giannis's career. 
Yeah, it's it's really still devastating that, you know, Charles died. And I really hope the book honors who he was as a person, somebody that sacrificed, that taught kindness, that taught them how to love. As Veronica told me, the mother told me, um, Charles was somebody that always had a smile on his face, no matter what was going on. Um, he wouldn't eat for two days if it meant his kids would eat. Um, he was so proud of Giannis. Uh, he, he just beamed at him when he came to Milwaukee and he would try to tidy up Giannis's apartment when Giannis was at road games, just, just so lovely. Um, and that was obviously devastating for all of them. Um, so, you know, everything that Giannis does and everything that his brothers do, I know that uh, they're doing it for their dad. Um, there was a thing, there was a, um, an art, uh, what do you call it, like a portrait in their basement that I saw when I um, was at their home. And it was a very beautiful canvas with all the brothers and they're all like going in different directions with the ball. And uh, it says, I am my father's legacy at the top. So that's that's kind of what motivates them all. And can you talk about probably the significance that Giannis has, you know, you, knowing that knowing the fact that his father has such a huge impact on him, what do you think his father probably would have told him knowing that he just won a championship? Well, there was a quote that I really liked um, from when Giannis um, decided to sign the extension and stay in Milwaukee. And Giannis said, you know, if my dad could see me, he'd be dancing right now. So I imagine that, you know, winning the finals would just be that even more elation. It's simply incredible. And you announced this book, probably you, you announced this book months ago for a August release. But now Giannis in the past three weeks has written a whole nother chapter of it. I'm <laughs> speculating, it's like, all right, so Mira needs this victory, Mira needs this victory. And of course, this is huge. <laughs> this is huge. <laughs> not only from a marketing standpoint, but from a curiosity for readers, what's gonna come next? Is the book is the book done now or is there more to come now that Giannis has won an NBA championship? You know, I was just on an email thread and we were like, so are you adding more? Like what's going on? So um, <laughs> TBD. Wondering. TBD, uh, we're figuring that out. Um, I think people on Twitter are so funny and <laughs> kind and like, you know, the the Kermit typing meme yes, or like yes, the, yes. the cat typing yes. meme. And, you know, that's going to be me. Like I said, I have coffee. I can do it. <laughs> and where do you go from here? Giannis Antetokounmpo, he has such a he has such a unique story. And you've profiled some of the greatest athletes in the world. And what comes to mind for me is LaMelo Ball. But for Giannis, you spoke a little bit about why you took on the story. But what was it about Giannis' story, his legacy, his career, that made you want to take on his project as opposed to the thousands of other young stars in athletics that you probably could have tackled? Yeah, I mean, I um, when I'm doing a story, I always think like, okay, they have to be more than just great at their sport. Like, what is something interesting or compelling about them or human about them that makes them you know, um, relatable to people, or is there something universal here that I can explore? And so I'm always looking for the human. And Giannis' story is the embodiment of human. It's the embodiment of the American dream. It's the embodiment of um, being a good person, doing things right, working hard. Um, these are all themes that all of us can relate to, family, um, having respect for people. Um, and so I was just like, the human aspect of this is out of this world. And we have the basketball aspect where we're kind of witnessing one of the greatest players of all time right now. Um, so I was just like very excited to to dive into his story and learn more. His legacy certainly isn't done. As you said, he's only 26 years old, two MVPs mm -hmm. this is the year, finals MVP. He mentioned in his post-game presser that he could not sit there ever again and he'd be satisfied. When you hear that, you know, knowing the, the relationship you now have with him, what do you take away from him saying that? He basically said right now he's satisfied. If he never wins another title, then he'd be perfectly content. What do you take away from that, knowing the story you just wrote? You know, I feel like I I was surprised because I feel like he's the type to be in the gym tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. But now he's going so, to play, right? <laughs> <You're 50 laughs> right. <years. laughs> right. So I, I have a feeling that once he wins – you know, he's won one, he's gonna wanna win two, he's gonna wanna win three. This is a person that is relentless, like he will never stop pushing for greatness. And certainly it's gonna be a journey that we can all keep our eyes on for years and years to come. Marin, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me today. Giannis, the improbable rise of an NBA MVP, releases August 10th, pre-orders are available now, 
Amazon's, Amazon's an obvious one, but really anywhere you get your books, you're on your way to being a New York Times bestseller. I know, <laughs> I know that for a fact. So you can play it humble, but everybody knows it's coming. It's coming. So. Can our listeners see that I'm hiding and turning bright as <laughs> red as a tomato? I don't know about that, but thank you so much for having me and, and for your kindness and wonderful questions.